Hey, Shishti, thank you. Um, hey, guys, uh, welcome to Design Lounge. I'm Aditi Vitas Vadhar, um, and I'm the moderator for this episode. Uh, I'm a product designer from NID and an entrepreneur. Um, I started my own bag brand uh, for leather goods called Vitasta. I'm also an educator, and I've been um, associated with Pearl for a while now. So the design lounge is, the, the format is pretty straightforward, so I'm just going to quickly um, go through that. Um, I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, we have two very fantastic speakers today. The topic of conversation, um, and after which they will both uh, present a small talk. Uh, we are gonna have some questions uh, and conversation happening between the three of us. Um, and once 45 minutes are, around 45 minutes are over, we're going to open up the question, the Q&A to the listeners tuned in. So thank you very much for tuning in and um, please feel free to ask any relevant or irreverent questions in the chat box and I'll direct them to the speakers and we'll try and get as many answered as we can. In case we run out of time, uh, you are most welcome to send your questions post session to designlaungeindia at gmail.com uh, and we'll share the details in the chat box and we'll try our best to get them answered later. Uh, this episode is, will be, is being streamed uh, live on the Facebook page. Uh, you can also check it out. Uh, so I'd like to get started by introducing Akshat Pat. Hey, Akshat. Akshat is the principal architect of Architecture Discipline, a multidisciplinary design practice he founded in 2007 in New Delhi. Uh, Akshat graduated from TVB in 2002. His memorable projects include the uh, flagship restaurants, uh, restaurant at the Oberai Kolkata, the luxury suites at the Oberai New Delhi, and the JDH project, which is an ongoing regeneration project. In is more attuned to a progressive vision of design and architecture, and it reflects in a lot of projects his practice. As anyone who's visited his studio, as I have, um, this comes across quite clearly, including his immersive love of progressive music, his personal collection of beautiful guitars, which I admit I know very little about. Most of my conversations with Akshat have been about product design and in particular bags, but I'm always in tune with his philosophical approach to design and tech his boldness and his clever ideas of building things through collaborations. Our second speaker is Ayaz Basrai. Hey Ayaz. Uh, Ayaz is a co-founder of the Basrai Design Studio along with his brother Zamir Basrai in Bombay. Ayaz graduated NID um, from NID as a product designer in 2003. The studio maintains a wide range of interests from urban design uh, to immersive media design and research. The design and research arm is what I asked to forward independently and started the bus ride labs in Goa. The lab works on projects on heritage conservation and futures research. Uh, in today's talk, I think you'll see a lot of how Ayaz's work cuts across dimensions um, of speculative fiction, architecture, media, and technology. Ayaz is also a prolific and funny storyteller and writer and educator. And I would urge you to follow his work and read his publications, which are readily available online. In fact, uh, we'll be sharing links to both of their works, um, their content in the chat box, so please do check it out. Uh, on a personal note, they're both good friends of mine. I like talking to them, I like listening to them, and I always learn something new, and I think that's gonna be happening today as well. So I'm thrilled that they're here, so thank you guys. Uh, so let me get to also the topic for today. Uh, speculative futures came up as a rumination of the current state of things. These days, uh, it seems humanity is at odds with a lot of things. Our environments, our polluted cities and buildings, our politics and our culture. It seems if we continue down this path of ecological destruction, we're looking at a pretty dystopic future. Alternatively, if we can reimagine more intelligently designed ecosystems, minimize wastage, and find ethical ways to create and consume things, we can course correct to a more sustainably attuned future. What I find interesting about this theme and these speakers in particular is how deeply engaged they are with these forward thinking ideas. And they actively try and talk about them and visualize these progressive alternatives. So without further ado, I would like to ask Akshat to start the conversation off. 
and I'd request um, everyone to just mute their sound as well. Thank you. Thanks, Aditi. Um, so at Architecture Discipline, we believe that um, if you can generate your own power and treat your own waste, you'd have stumbled upon a miracle that may just save humanity. And that's a belief that has been driving us for the last uh, well, 10 years until, the, until recently. Some more studies helped us discover that that may not be the entire truth. Um, what is true though, is that our approach to things as designers have to change as our, as our conditions change and the projection for our future changes. That's why it's important to, um, to speculate in future development and there are various levels for, at which you speculate that. Uh, and it's determined by three fundamental factors there are people process and place and, and um, place and the place and people can often be categorized as context um, and we don't want to treat it like a shallow veneer of context as in what material you have available to you and what is the resource base available to you in terms of labor and whatnot but this is just a much it's a, it's a slightly larger understanding of uh, of of place now, we've all been told that the future of energy is sustainable or uh, is sustainable power. And that sustainable power or sustainable energy is renewables, uh, the first being solar and the second being wind. But we found even the most efficient sustainable system works at best 30% uh, most of the time. And if you were to, if you were to take England as an example, you would consume 25% of that tree's land service. Uh, wind farms only return a very small amount of energy. Now start multiplying that with the way humanity is expanding and you see a fairly grim reality in front of you. Um, so the first study that we did uh, recently was the assumed uh, AD development along the Central Vista. Well, this was well before the Central Vista project was announced um, on the 5th of September in 2019. So this study goes back to sometime in 2018, where we repop we said we've run out of land. Let's see what happens if we have to repopulate, you know, the Rajpath Greens. So the trade doesn't happen, but we repopulate it with a fully sustainable city with you know, playgrounds, electric boats, electric vehicles, self-sustaining electric and wind power, uh, buildings that can be reconfigured and buildings that are modular in nature. Uh, so that's the stretch that we took as a study. And as we started projecting it, as we started, we started mapping our, well, 2018, you start with, you know, a nice green with a little water body, and that's all you need really to a flat piece of land. So you need to start an efficient development you come up with the highest level of green buildings that you can't possibly uh, that you can't possibly outdo, and you have sustainable or self-generating modes of transport, and you have sustainable resource. Slowly, as our needs increase, these buildings will get taller, the development will become denser, uh, and eventually, nature will take its own course. Uh, we mapped that out, and these are let's, let's not forget that these are all speculative and sort of an extreme. Uh, mappings but uh, the forest goes down buildings come in communication systems come in um, power generation happens uh, trees crop up and then again some denser skyscrapers come up and the water table rises and destroys the city finally takes over and it is what it is. And if you look at some of uh, some of the big industrial Eastern Europe, you'll find that this actually has happened. 
So the, our diastopic projections of the future are not really diastopic projections of the future. They're often, they are often driven by our learnings from the past uh, and their reactions. Um, around the same time, a project was announced, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back. And this was our understanding of theology. And again, this was uh, triggered by one visit to uh, the Central Vista where I'd gone to see some of the government issues. And I came back. And then monkeys became, was not just a, a literal translation of monkeys. You actually did have your way through those. Uh, and soon after the, you know, the Rashtrapati Bhavan redevelopment project was announced where we started looking at how ideological constructs start taking over and start determining your bit environment and your bit future. And is that, you know, that's what that means is that political will notwithstanding is not a term, is not a phrase that you use when we talk, when we as designers start talking about things. Um, around 2019, uh, another another incident happened, which was the which was the burning the second time burning of the Notre Dame, uh, and. Just as the fires were burning, we started talking about this in the studio. We said, look, what's going to happen now? Are they going to conserve it or, is, or are people going to come up with ridiculous ideas? Well, before they announced the conservation project again, the first thing that happened was that people came up with ridiculous ideas for, um, for the Notre Dame project. I think I've lost a video here. But they came up with ridiculous ideas to say, let's make it out of steel and glass. Let's make a forest on top of it and so on and so forth. It's a projection on how we can't let monuments be there is a way religion determines and interacts with us and i think that it was an ideological determinant at one point in time uh, in our daily lives now we're disconnected from it so we're disconnected from ideology uh, and philosophy in a manner that is really shallow um, so we only turn back to the time of often at the time of a marriage, which is now reducing, and at the time of a funeral. Uh, that's actually what's happened in Japan in terms of their, their philosophy as well. Um, you start looking at that, you say, what happens when communities go in? Um, well, that actually example in front of us, an example of extreme communities have actually yielded uh, change. So if you look, if you go back to the, to the flower power movement of the 60s, and we start looking for we start looking for parallels here. You find a, a festival that happens every year called the Burning Man, which has a certain number of principles. It's a principle that it's a festival that's not that claims to not be rooted in any uh, commodification or any financial transaction. It means you come and you spend a certain number of days there. They say they set up the place in two months, and you leave no mark behind. It's absolutely clean, which is correct. They do. It's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible uh, celebration of uh, the human spirit and of human ability. Uh, and they come up with extreme examples of um, of structure of of iconic settings of iconic uh, iconic ideas, uh, but it is still rooted in a commodification because the first thing you have to do is you have to buy your way into it and you have to not just buy your way into it through money you have to buy your your, your way into it through deeds um, what is a good example at burning man though is that it works only off a barter system there is no financial transaction that happens once you're inside burning man what's future of mobility um, the future of mobility the future of energy uh, etc are sort of Again, now, you know, well, while in this pleasant trend, and this pleasant trend was actually generated by uh, my studio, is actually fairly diastopic that you are, you are in an automotive, uh, you're in an autonomous vehicle, and you're taken from point A to point B, you do know where you want to go, but that autonomous vehicle is autonomous up at the end of the day, so you don't know where it'll take you. But there are guys like Space 10 doing, doing uh, studies on the same, 
on the same ideas and what will happen in autonomous vehicles actually do become mainstream so uh, the, on the left is an example of a of a moving hospital so it sort of healthcare comes to you uh, a flexible office space that comes to you now let's not forget these exercises were done by space 10 about 4 or 5 years ago and it's fairly telling of our current time that um, you know in in this in in time post pandemic you could be looking at you know small little uh, healthcare facilities coming up to you because they don't want you moving around the city you isolate within your within your own homes you have little office spaces that are flexible we're all working out of home but what happens when a small number of us need to really get together uh, and talk uh, what happens when you have a guest over so you have a hotel on wheels and then space ten went on to project something called uh, future farming so these are hydroponics and they created a little um, an an open sourced uh, hydroponic farm so you could actually take uh, you could actually farm your own food for the entire year off uh, a little sphere that you set up for yourself at home and you create your own food or people or you or you sort of dispense it to the community um, obviously small examples of this do happen in india right you have a radio wala coming to you giving you food and what not but is this is now a future projection and that's how designers often start seeing it we start disconnecting ourselves from 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 some of the actual scenarios that happen around us which is what i often call critical distance and not critical intimacy with the subject um but well they went on to do exercises um with ikea space ten by the way is funded by ikea and therefore their future projection is biased by what ikea would want to do as a financial uh, uh you know uh, as a financial setup so the future of food was actually you know their take on the historic ikea ikea uh, meatballs where they uh where they've now decided to start using uh, to use well far food or greens that are grown hydroponically but also use the worms and uh, the insects that are that sort of that that you'll find within that hydroponic system to create like non vegetarian food to get get you uh, the non veg protein you need the truth is we're at the we're already living in an age of ai that you are being tracked you know that uh, applications like facebook and google and netflix can already predict what your next move is going to be these are all subtle we think it doesn't exist but ai is actually already all around us it's already taking over everything um and the debate then becomes do you want to do you want to engage with it or you want to disengage with it does this does this kind of development paradigm lead to the end of innovation uh and dumb us down in many ways or does it uh, does it deal any kind of freedom and often we sort of what happens these days is that you sort of fool yourself into believing that we have certain number of freedom um that's a very that's an orwellian truth so um when you go back in time you'll see that these things are predicted so if you read the novel 1984 by george orwell and i insist that everyone studying design read a few such uh, books well you read 1984 you read the hitchhiker's guide uh, you read the fountain head i'm not saying the very deep uh, deep uh, and very very an intense literature pieces but i think they they give you a hint into or, a, or they sort of guide you into what into how much people project futures and they are not just it's not just limited to designers and design thinkers it's across the it's across the board now what orwell predict, predicted in 1949 for in for a world in 1984 became a has become a much used has has sort of given us much used terms such as big brother double think new speak fake news you know fake history uh, created history um orwellian well orwellian systems dictatorial systems uh people watching monitoring so on and so forth uh and it kind of went the expression of it went in hand with what uh, grammar uh 
a group from the 60s in England was actually, of architects and designers from the 60s, was actually saying. So it was a hugely influential collective that was talking about walkable cities, walking cities, moving cities. Uh, some, of the, some of the original proponents of Archigram still exist, and I would urge you to see their work. So Peter Cook, for example, was talking about walking cities. Ron Heron had designed something that then later on to be, uh, became the building that influenced the Sunset of Pompidou, which is one of the most visited buildings in the world today. Um, and it became a source for, I mean, while their take on it and their take and all the take from the 60s on a sort of future is diastopic. It is sort of dire, but it is usually a humorous take on such things. There's usually some, um, some angle to it. And that's also because you can't really project a future. Any future, that future projection that we make is inaccurate. But that doesn't mean that it's not valid. Um, Akshat, now that uh, till, till, I, have a, yes. I have a quick question. Sorry. I wanted to circle back to what you were talking about at the beginning also in terms of ideology. Um, mm -hmm. When you mentioned your project for the Rajpati Bhavan and the Notre Dame, um, what kind of uh, impact does, um, what kind of like political ideology, for example, uh, in connection to Rajpati Bhavan? When you talk about ideology, can you elaborate a little bit for our speakers about how it either influences negative or positively, how you speculate about, um, about the future perspectives? Uh, for example, even Burning Man, what are the ideologies that essentially drive these kinds of visions, let's say? Um, I, think, I think it begins with critical intimacy. I think it begins with all, in any and all ideology begins with a criticism of this, a critique of the system that exists around you. Being, uh, I think, feeling that uh, with, with an understanding, not just a, well, first a feeling and then an understanding that what are And it's master slave that's only just evolution, right? So what I think uh, maybe you know medicine in terms of be it of ideology, be it of how we deal with each other, a computer monitor, right? We're not sitting right in front of each other. So it is easy for someone to intervene and sort of stop, right? So there is a moderator we have and the moderator, if they don't like either one of what we're saying, can actually stop this conversation right now. And that's big brother, right? You don't want to be in that scenario ever, right? You, because one of the fundamental values and the fundamental needs of all mankind is freedom. Now that thou, I think often, and as I move along, we sort of, we as designers sort of tend to start wearing blinkers and we start straight jacketing into into future of our future projections. Right? So, um, case in point might might. Uh, Lead to an uproar, but um, we all know that we know where these devices come. You know, they are medium, whereas the other ones actually just songs which are being the cross. Uh, the same for the Apple Watch. So, I think as designers, often there are there are short loops and long loops for um, for future thinking, um, and we're all usually driven towards the skill set that will give us the short loop such as this, uh, which are, which are pro product driven manifested ideas, which are doable either now or in the near future. But there was a time when people like Buckminster Fuller, um, Archie Graham, uh, for one, who else named some, were actually projecting, uh, constructed futures, built futures, constructed realities, the need for a future uh, in a more utopian and a more sort of idealistic manner, but they were doing it and it was realizable, right? So that's where 
say Buckminster Fuller's what Fuller's ideas of the geodesic dome finally led to the creation of uh, well any odd Mars Mars or lunar shelter or or uh, yeah. that we may talk about or we is, may have seen. Isn't Ayas actually was mentioning that uh, in our talk earlier about the the sort of the metaphysical aspect of uh, Buckminster Fuller's work, like the philosoph- philosophical aspect of how he imagined the utopic vision. I think I asked you were mentioning something about that, um, that he was really a futurist, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, he was able to, I think, uh, because he was uh, also, he spent time on a battleship, right? Uh, so one of the seminal learnings that he writes about is that on his time on the battleship, he was able to look at technology in a very uh, dispassionate way. Like every single technology on the battleship uh, is actually going out to kill or to uh, destroy, uh, you know, an enemy. But uh, it has a desalination plant. It has it's running on, uh, you know, extremely efficient uh, energy cells. So what he was able to look beyond the physical forms of that technology to see what the purpose of that technology is and how that could be repurposed. So I mean, his entire, you know, uh, kind of uh, worldview went beyond what the uh, form of the battleship was, but he could actually see what it could be. Which is uh, yeah, fantastic. What's interesting is I think most uh, cultures that have that have invested deeply in uh, warfare are able to use <coughs> a spin-off from that onto um, onto their mainstream existence in some time or the other, right? So uh, it it becomes a it's about how something that is extreme, that is used for a negative purpose, eventually turns around to become something positive. Take nuclear power, for example. Right? Nuclear power is still, after we do our studies on renewables, is still the cleanest method of power generation because it takes very little. It's easy to dispose. And when you look at statistics, you will realize that nuclear power kills fewer people than yeah. well, solar power and, and wind power. So, you know, it's often marketing and it's often how something is projected. But it's the need to survive, you know, and if you look at maybe, and it's just come to me, like maybe war or battle is that sort of a scenario where there is a need for human survival and everything, your success or failure hinges on that one fundamental reality, right? And therefore, what you do has to be extreme, efficient, discreet, and cutting edge every time. And it has to give you the edge over everybody else. Uh, and it's when that starts spinning off onto your mainstream. I mean, I think another example of a pacifist use of or pacifist technology that does that is Formula One racing, right? So if you look at most of our cars today, they have uh, curves systems. Built, most electric cars today have kinetic energy regeneration systems built into them, which actually came for the last 10 years of Formula One racing because the braking motion would actually sort of right. store the energy into a capacitor and then I would sort of propagate that. Even the internet was about- like uh, started off with DARPA. So, I mean, it's uh, the internet is military technology. What's, what's DARPA? Military technology. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the DARPA yes. net um, in the US, uh, it was sort of, sorry, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was military tech. So it was actually built for the military and then uh, eventually declassified and it became kind of, you know, the HTTP protocol. And so, I mean, the history of the internet is uh, a military development. Fun times. Yeah, well, I so a lot like um, an event, but I think eventually what we must realize is that as designers, as people who are projecting 30, 40, 50 years into the future, if you want to be futurist, if you want, if you realize the relevance and value of your ideas beyond the point in time, then one must realize that there has to be, one has to start looking um, at other systems. I think so far we look at, uh, more often than not, we look at just build systems. We look at the projection of build systems. We look at energy and consumption and, uh, uh, well, how we generate free energy and so on and so forth. But no one's really looking at, with, with existing understanding of how macro, or how economic systems work, nobody's really looking at the reduction of consumption per se. Because the moment you start reducing your consumption and you change your patterns of consumption, you affect you affect the, the, the physical environment, right? So uh, the current scenario is a case in point, right? The world slows down significantly and the earth cleans up, 
right? And that's that's a really, really, uh, I think that's a very significant telling point or guiding factor should be a guiding point for all of us as designers and architects that what happens when you switch from a, switch from a money-based economy to a resource-based system, to a system that is a system that will cater to your needs without you really having to do a lot of unnecessary things to arrive at those fundamental needs. Yeah. So while sort of looking that while studying that principle, we came across something called the Venus Project. Now the Venus Project is dead. It's 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 no longer uh, it, well. It's it's sort of dry, it's been dragging its feet for the last twenty years, but that's because a lot of systems don't want projects like this to take off. Also remember that when I look at a rendering of the Venus Project like this, it sort of scares me because it's a little too utopian and too well Orwell like for me, uh, a too sort of uh, Euclidean uh, so to speak. You know, so it's, it's one sort of damage. Yeah. It's radial, yeah. yeah. And you'll see that. And I, we were talking about this earlier, also. Right? Most of these will have that, and then they'll try funny. Yeah, things Lotus Temple is the same. Lotus Temple is the same master plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And then they'll try funny things to try and break that rigidity. Right? It's very hard to break a circle radial rigidity. Well, now the parametrics a little bit more, but not still not so much. But fundamentally, it is that one concentric idea right it comes from maybe the understanding of the, the the graphic understanding of the universe or the atom and so on and so forth which we know doesn't exist you know like after the atom and the elements we found <laughs> the quark and the the god particle now we're searching for the god yeah. particle right and dark energy so but the fact is that it does it there may be lots of things wrong with it but i think what the venus project really does direct you towards is the idea of a resource-based economy or a resource-based system what you have is and and we are at that point in uh, in global technology be it hydroponics be it energy generation be it natural resource be it the use of natural resource i think we have enough and more to meet the needs of our generation and still enable future generations to meet their own needs you know and continue to do so but it is absolutely essential for us to look at a method of or an approach that reduces cons consumption fundamentally. Of course, treat your own waste, generate your own energy, but generate lesser waste and use lesser energy at the same time. But use it more efficiently, at least. Of course, of course. Uh, distribution, right? I mean, if you look at just how our current our current uh, systems lead to uh, have like tremendously inefficient distribution systems, right? Even if you look at an electric car, right? Suddenly, the electric car is the answer to our future, but there is a limited life cycle. And even if you're generating fuel for the electric car, it's being shipped to you from various parts of the world, and it's being shipped, and that ship is still consuming fuel. Yeah, all that fuel. And then when it yeah. comes to you. That car has a limited life cycle. So while your fuel car, if it was well made and was not and was not traded for the idea of uh, uh, traded up or traded down for the idea of uh, economy or prestige or status, it would sort of last you forever. Right? Uh, if it was driven appropriately and we were all and 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 there was a there was a certain kind of stratification on the, on the road network it wouldn't need to be overbuilt for it to be safe right like a nano was a great it was a great starting point it was a great point of departure it was in my opinion it was a product that really did demonstrate the essence of product design you know per se it uh, may not have been supremely well made or supremely well engineered but it was really there it was it was i think the modern answer to buckminster fuller's dimaxion car uh, but we just never used it enough. Um, I think at the end of the day, the, the one thing that throws me off about projects, even like the Venus project, is that they don't accept, they don't, they don't address people as people, as individuals. And I think that's one that we have to crack, right? Can we look at projects like that and, and look at embracing um, people as a whole within that sort of, uh, within, within that paradigm. And, yeah. uh, sorry. <coughs> no, no, go ahead, sorry. I, I was, I was, I, I think this is my last slide, so I'm done with that.
and I can stop projecting now. But if someone has any questions, um, before yeah, I ask we actually call. have we actually have a couple of questions for um, both of you guys. Uh, but I think it was interesting what you said at the end. A couple of things about how it's telling that uh, people slow down and the earth cleans up. So it's a it's a good point of reference to study what that means actually from a philosophical point of view. The other thing that you mentioned was how to start shift perspective in trying to modify and uh, meet a market, view people as consumers and then create products for them rather than having people-centric ideas and design thinking and then create um, the, needs, the needs which which will take care of the needs of the people. So we need to move away from sort of a market supply demand consumer sort of a framework which is largely how we work today and more towards a you know sustainable regenerative needs-based people-centric idea of what design should be um with that i have a i have one question that's come up actually from shristi is um the names for your um for both your practices the bus ride and architecture discipline sound very different and good. Um, they, you know, uh, they want to know how did you come up with, with the names, uh, both of you, for your practice. Go Who first. To go first. <laughs> I, I think the bus ride sounds cool. I think architecture has been sounds boring. <laughs> <laughs> bus ride was my name and dragging. Yeah, it was. I can, I can, I can, I can attest to that. It wasn't. It wasn't a stroke of inspiration for him anything else. Yeah, it just it became my first email ID, and then uh, I happened to start the studio with my brother and dad, who fortunately have the same surname, so it just kind of uh, fit, and we didn't think too much about it. And architecture? No, you had you the the barcode of architecture discipline. Where did that come from? Um. That it was actually the fastest way to, you know, when, when I started my practice, it was out of a basement, right? And uh, well, it was a tiny basement that was, we were competing for a project. And uh, at that time, we were using a software called Coral Draw, and Coral had a, had a barcode maker. It was the fastest way to come up with something that sort of had this idea of a unified or like sort of like a, like a com it was almost like you know your drawings are a commodity you know, and I felt like that and it sort of worked with that that you've commodified something that you do right when you send out a drawing you commodify your thought and that's what it is and uh, so architecture discipline as a name was sort of fit for many reasons because of because a architecture is a discipline b when I started practicing architects were not really disciplined most of us were about most architecture Architects were considered architecture students, and architects were considered cool if they were wearing slippers, wearing uh, wearing torn or shabby clothes, and sort of not giving drawings on time, sleeping, uh, waking up late, and uh, oh well, waking up late and sleeping, sleeping super late as well, or sleeping most part of the day. Uh, Sounds and like so, most of my early twenties. So yeah. There you go, and we realized that architecture needs to be an architect. Architect needs to be disciplined. Um, and we had it, we had to be disciplined in our delivery because I think most Indian architects were not at the time. Also, I had stolen it from John Petrucci's Rock Discipline, <laughs> which was very cool. I think that's what um, I heard. I was waiting for you to come to that because I know you've mentioned this somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. I used to I used to watch Rock Discipline every week, you know, to practice my guitars. And before and so I was like, hey, this is this this sort of intensity is what I want to bring to my studio. Uh, the barcode, like I said, was simple. It was sort of, I just felt like I was commodifying everything that I was doing. It commod, commod, like the moment you make a drawing, you have manifested thought at some level. And just the fact to me that you send that drawing out to somebody else, which is actually, you know, sort of, it's not really your vision. You're sort of, and it, when, you're, when you're designing on commission, when you're designing for somebody else, you're often realizing somebody else's vision. You may be sort of doing it through subterfuge. You may be sneaking in your own ideas and your own thoughts and your own whatever. But the, the overall, the overarching vision, even if it is for a house, like it's one guy who said, who's come to you and said, I want a house for myself and for my family and this is who we are. And you know, or when you make a hotel, you say, this is a hotel for such and such. Or even when you make a city, right? So I think that idea was uh, what led to this. I lost you, Aditi. You're on mute. 
Sorry about that. So I think we're going to move uh, ahead and uh, let Ayaz um, uh, take the conversation forward. Ayaz, please take it away. Cool. Thank you, guys. Let me just do a quick check. Yeah. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Looks oh, yeah. good. Fantastic. Uh, so first up, uh, thank you very much, Aditi. Uh, thank you, Pearl. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, just last two days chatting with both Aditi and Akshat and uh, just that has been fully worth it. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, what I'll try to do is uh, maybe take you guys through a little bit of our process. Um, you know, uh, just to... Am I audible? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. So, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, just a little bit of a reality check. Like, so back in 1920, uh, the New York Times very confidently stated that a rocket could never leave the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, this could have shut down, uh, you know, many people's space programs. Uh, but uh, I guess the, the human spirit to folly kind of continues. And then, uh, you know, people are still trying to escape the Earth's atmosphere, I guess, even today. And uh, so this, uh, on this humbling note, I mean, uh, I think one kind of, uh, one can safely assume that every single idea that we have of our future will most definitely be wrong at some level. And uh, at the same time, I think the power of uh, speculative fiction is really, uh, you know, the, the most boring aspect of, uh, you know, working with the future is the prediction aspect of it, right? Because that still in some way says that the future is deterministic and, you know, there is a point A and a, point, and a singular point B where we'll all reach. But, uh, you know, our experience of today is, uh, is not that. I mean, we're sitting on multiple, multiple futures and multiple possibilities. And uh, I think each one of those possibilities is interesting to kind of visualize and speculate about. So uh, I could just maybe uh, do a quick comparative between uh, the role of design and speculation, right? So uh, if you look at uh, this sort of thought process, uh, it would look very familiar to every single student of design. Like you normally have a brief. Uh, which uh, if you're designing a home would come from the homeowner. If you're designing a you know, classroom project, it would come from your faculty. Uh, you normally start with some sort of a brief. It could be a brief that you give yourself as well. It normally sort of proceeds into information collection, brainstorming, ideation. Uh, all of these are kind of you know, fairly familiar to people who work with design process. Uh, you will have an analysis and synthesis phase uh, based on which you create a few prototypes and hypotheses. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get some sort of a launch, you would also have market testing and promotion. Uh, that would sort of create your final prototype. It could go into promotion and marketing uh, in the future, kind of look at sales and target tracking as well. So this would be a typical uh, road to market for most products. It could be a road to market for any kind of uh, you know, manifestation of design process. Uh, what I believe is the power of speculative fiction is that it could provide the ideas for which briefs have not yet been written. Right. So, for example, uh, if one had to visualize a culture in the midst of a global pandemic uh, with limited access to uh, light and ventilation and, uh, you know, uh, fresh produce where you have no idea who sneezed on your food before it's come to your house. Uh, there are many, many of these kind of speculative futures which one could actually have uh, regularly engaged with to better prepare us for today. But uh, sadly, that's not how we work or that's not how we run our practices. So. Uh, within this uh, kind of framing, uh, I felt like one of the things that we are really interested about is to run uh, kind of, you know, future tracks that, uh, and there are a few, you know, be direct benefits. I think uh, speculative fiction, the, the big benefit is kind of opens up possibilities because uh, we tend to be a lot more firefighting uh, on a, in, when we work in the present. But when, as soon as you work in the future, you tend to actually uh, be cognizant of 10 different kind of scenarios in which things could go horribly wrong, things could go very right. And it allows you to kind of access parts of your brain that uh, you would probably not have access to if you're primarily working on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it also creates idea catalysts because uh, uh, speculative fiction has uh, immense uh, sticky power. Like someone else will see your speculation and then uh, have three more ideas about the way they feel their future would be. And the best part is that all these ideas, uh, once catalyzed, are all valid. So uh, it kind of grows in a web-like exponential way. Uh, it also, uh, this is something that we do personally. I feel uh, one of the things that uh, we try to do in, re in research is to ground our imaginations in the everyday. So you'll see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the future is very whimsical, uh, like, our, like our present. Uh, you'll have, uh, I mean, you know, apart from the big trends in tech and the big trends in space travel and, you know, uh, discovery of, uh, you know, new nanoparticles, 
uh, along with that, it's also interesting to visualize what it's like, what is your interaction with your vegetable seller like, or who's Xeroxing your papers, you know, in the future. Like, so, I mean, those kind of uh, more day-to-day -day grime and the grime and dust of the future is kind of really exciting for us. So we try to engage in the everyday quite a lot. Um, the future speculation also allows you to embrace the extreme and the inspiring, right? So there's, uh, whenever, whenever you're, uh, you know, responding to a brief purely in the present, uh, it's normally based on a certain budget or, uh, you know, certain real world kind of expectations. But with speculative fiction, one can actually toss a lot of that out of the window and say, you know, what would it be like if I had to, say, build a home uh, such that every day in that home is inspiring for the person who lives in it. And uh, therefore, one can reframe those kind of things, which could then put also potentially trickle down into your actual uh, design practice. And uh, the best part is, that I think, uh, for me, it creates pluralism, which I feel is uh, one of the big best antidotes to any kind of mono narrative, uh, whether it be uh, political propaganda or it be religious propaganda. I think plur uh, pluralism is really the way uh, we can combat a lot of that, where uh, especially in our postmodern condition, we can actually look at uh, the sort of uh, exactly what Akshat spoke about, uh, the, the sort of uh, the thesis, antithesis kind of framing. So uh, every point has a counterpoint within postmodernism. And that's actually really, really interesting to uh, build into future speculation, right? So I, I thought maybe uh, since you guys are also working with speculative fiction, uh, maybe hopefully right now as well as in the future, I could introduce you, a few, uh, introduce you guys to a few tools we use. Uh, one is fake news, uh, which is fantastic because um, uh, it's got a bad name uh, throughout uh, our own country's history as well as, you know, uh, authoritarian regimes all around the, all around the world. And uh, fake news can be deployed both ways. So uh, we started doing this project a while ago where we used to pick up uh, the headline of uh, the day and uh, start creating a hypothetical project around it. So, I mean, for you guys who are smokers, uh, you know, essentially, uh, if you smoke five, five cigarettes a day, it's going to cost you a crore by the time you hit 60. So, uh, people are not doing so well financially right now, probably good time to quit smoking. Uh, and uh, what, what was really interesting in our research, we found this beautiful crystal called turbonite. Right? So turbonite is highly radioactive. It's something that uh, will essentially reduce your life by 11 minutes every time you lick it. So uh, what's, what's fantastic is if you wear turbonite as a necklace around your uh, neck and every time you feel the need to uh, smoke a cigarette, you just give it a little lick. And uh, the best part is it has the exact same side effects as a cigarette. So it reduces your life by 11 minutes and without any of the hassle of uh, creating a passive smoking environment for other people who don't want to uh, inhale all those carcinogens. So uh, it's the life reduction without the uh, fuss. Um, so this is a, you know, a response to a headline. Uh, so what's interesting about this kind of engagement is it actually allows us to engage with satire and parody. Uh, which is normally uh, literature tools and which we don't uh, normally use in design process. But, uh, you know, parody is a big part of uh, speculative fiction for us. Uh, it also tends to normalize the extremes uh, so that you can actually uh, see the stupidity of the problem at hand, right? When you, ex when you take it to the extreme. Um, it also allows you to uh, sort of frame the scenario very briefly because you're working with news. So it's just a headline and that headline has to sum up the whole scenario. So it forces you to be uh, concise and uh, funny and, you know, eye catching with your uh, work. And uh, so if you guys are working with speculative fiction, it could be really interesting to write a fake article or write a fake news article about the thing that you have in mind, which allows you to externalize it in a really fun way. Uh, the second one is data visualization because, uh, you know, uh, this is like an example of uh, architectural data. This is the development plan of Bombay. Uh, so these are these come heavily coded. Uh, they come with multiple, uh, you know, errors. Uh, and if one has to actually try to say engage with the, you know, public architecture, like for example, Bombay has this uh, really misdirected large project uh, called the Coastal Road, and uh, they're trying to build this out at great uh, public expense. And one of the things that speculative fiction allows us to do is to engage with these kind of opaque planning documents, but create, uh, you know, a policy and, uh, you know, sort of public uh, awareness. So what we started doing as a, a collective, which is called the Bandra Collective, which is uh, six architecture studios who are all kind of, you know, focusing their practices towards uh, more public facing work. Uh, we try to actually create a few GIFs, uh, which would show uh, what this coastal road actually looks like when it's implemented. So this is the Haji Ali Darga on a good day and uh, what actually happens with the coastal road is uh, you have this massive proposed interchange right up there 
in front. So uh, visuals like this actually make the you know the dystopia uh, visible, and you can actually start seeing uh, what these things look like uh, when they're actually implemented. So this is a peaceful early morning yoga class on Juhu Beach, and uh, what you have is like a really nice big coastal uh, crossing that. So. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the idea was like, you know, these kind of visuals get uh, circulated fairly widely. Uh, so, Scroll picked this up and a few publications picked this up to kind of, you know, showcase what uh, this thing actually is going to look like uh, when it's being experienced. So, what this allows us to do is to kind of reimagine abstract data, right? Like you have, uh, ab abstract data comes in various forms. It comes in Excel sheets, it comes in CSV values, it comes as, uh, you know, opaque kind of planning documents. but with speculative fiction, one is able to write a little bit about these things. One is able to visualize them as a cultural artifact and, you know, also again, engage the extremes and uh, you can make informed decisions from a fairly dispassionate data set. So that's something which is quite exciting. Uh, this is something that uh, is a very, very interesting tool. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about this. Like uh, when you have nostalgia, it's normally associated with uh, the past. Right, like that. Uh, these are common experiences that we've all shared, or it's a place that we remember, or the city that we grew up in. There are certain references to uh, a nostalgic past, and normally it's framed as if the past was better than what is uh, the reality in which we inhabit. Which is, you know, segueing a little bit from what Akshat said about uh, having a little discomfort with our current reality, which then spawns new ideologies. And uh, What's really interesting about the uh, about the word nostalgia is was it was earlier supposed to be a medical condition. Like people have been hospitalized from nostalgia, right? Like so, this was supposed to be a debilitating condition of soldiers fighting in foreign lands, and uh, they couldn't move, they couldn't uh, build the will to kind of get up and fight because of nostalgia. And uh, what I find very interesting about speculative fiction is it allows us to create nostalgia for the future. So if you're able to very, very uh, interestingly visualize and make something very, uh, you know, seductive, uh, available for public consumption, the next response is why is that not happening today? You know, that's the kind of itch that what uh, that speculative fiction should I believe, leave you with. So on this, I'd like to just quickly take you through three sort of uh, projects that we were working on. One is a sort of critique of the Statue of Unity, uh, which is, uh, again, a statue built at great public expense. It's uh, mostly taxpayer money that's going into funding this, uh, I mean, has already gone into uh, building this statue. And uh, I think uh, in the studio, I don't think one is contesting the idea of building statues because as a species, we've been building statues for the last 35,000 years. Uh, but uh, the idea is that if one has uh, so much access to uh, you know, public opinion, funding, uh, resources, uh, why not make something performative uh, and also not just purely ornamental or, or kind of symbolic of uh, political ideology. So we were trying to visualize performative statues that how do you take a statue and make it uh, functioning and, uh, you know, important part of the way a city is conceived. So if you look at uh, India's record, it's the fifth largest e-waste producer in the world. Uh, we produced 2 million tons of e-waste in 2016. And so that's uh, a statue response. Like uh, you can have an urban, uh, an e-waste urban mine and a sorting center. So as soon as gold is rescued from old PCBs, it comes up and is starting to gold plate the statue. So the statue itself is a data visualization of how much gold is being rescued off the PCB. So as, uh, as e-waste is being mined and sorted, your statue starts getting gold. Uh, we can also look at, uh, you know, uh, the fact that most Indian cities are running dry, like uh, Chennai also ran dry, I think, uh, two years ago, uh, and now have, uh, you know, very, very scarce uh, supply of groundwater. So we were looking at uh, statues being desalination plants. So uh, I think the desalination currently is a very, very expensive option. But uh, there may be a time in the future where cities are forced to uh, get drinking water from offshore desalination plants. So why could not, say, a statue's resources be actually used to uh, create a you know, desalination plant within it. This is a specific statue for Delhi uh, for, uh, you know, most uh, traffic intersections. So you have a PM 2.5 scrubber uh, installed in a charkha, which is something I feel Gandhiji would really approve of. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, these kind of uh, statues installed at uh, busy intersections. Uh, this is also maybe a uh, I mean, I'd like to discuss this with you guys post the call, which was interesting. Like it's, uh, you know, some musings around the way we solve problems. So this is, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, a massive solar farm in uh, Tamil Nadu. This is the Kamuthi Solar Park, which is supposed to be one of the largest in Asia. 
And what's interesting is that they're uh, mostly uh, green energy initiatives, but uh, like Akshat said, extremely inefficient. If there's a single dust storm, the productivity drops to 8%. Uh, so, and these have to be cleaned. Uh, you know, this is the kind of specs on that solar farm. So it's 2,500 acres of land, right? Uh, so it's a massive, massive land grab. And uh, you have, uh, you know, almost 6,000 kilometers of cables and 27,000 uh, square meters of structure. Uh, this is how it's cleaned every day. So this is, uh, it's cleaned by illegal water, which is mined from villages around. Uh, and this is normally subcontracted so that the company itself doesn't uh, have liability. But there are uh, other subcontractors who are clean, uh, cleaning these panels every day. So uh, it's anyone's guess about how clean this or how green this energy actually is, you know, if uh, one looks at true cost. And uh, what's really interesting is in our Indian context, uh, we have a very rich tradition of, uh, you know, religion. We have a very rich tradition of uh, sun temples. And, uh, you know, it's almost an invitation to build a new age sun temple with solar panels. So uh, what we try to do is we work with this amazing illustrator, uh, Yuvraj, to kind of, uh, you know, visualize what a, a 2035 sun temple could look like in Rajasthan. So again, this is our own version of a burning man, Akshat. Like this is the idea was to kind of, create something crazy in the middle of the desert, which would uh, become a cultural hotspot, which would also leave, uh, I mean, rather than leaving no trace, we could actually look at an upgrade your site kind of a program. And it's a, you know, it's a small node in the middle of the desert that's constantly harvesting uh, energy, but also a cultural venue. Because if you look at, I'll just skip back to a few slides, like I'm not sure what kind of party could happen in this kind of a scenario, right? Uh, it's typically technology that builds large uh, fences around itself. Uh, and it creates shapes and forms completely not of our choosing. So I think if we choose to build something beautiful with the current technology paradigm that we have, I think we can achieve a very, very interesting kind of uh, synthesis of these two uh, sort of domains. And a little bit of uh, Central Vista work that we did as well when we uh, you know, heard of this uh, competition that was announced. Uh, this is uh, you know, Delhi on a clear day. Uh, sort of, uh, so one of the ideas was that you know, because we got this amazing uh, air quality situation. Uh, I miss this, by the way, bus ride. <laughs> I miss these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, once we achieve our new normal, I mean, there's a chance that we go back to this again. So, yeah. that, shows that uh, you know, we can use our uh, existing smoke screen to kind of create late night raves. We have <laughs> a really cool uh, projection surface with, you know, serious uh, amount of firepower. So, you have your night ravers who come out to the, cent to the you know, to the to the parliamentary hill and then have your night raves and uh, in the interest of transparency i think that's a there was an interesting uh, word in the central vista brief that went out saying that you know we'd like to have a more transparent more public facing system so we thought what if we had to take that to the extreme where your whole central vista is visualized as a massive public promenade and parks and you have government offices that sit with uh, your promenade so that you can actually peep in and see what the prime minister is doing or you can actually, uh, you know, look into see the uh, the workings of the government in a fairly transparent way. So we're looking at government offices, which are also uh, when the government offices are not being used, they could actually be given as co-working spaces as well. So for public meeting spaces, so the government is in a sort of a work share situation with uh, with people who want to rent out these offices, and uh, the whole thing is visualized as a kind of a promenade. So uh, the idea is to kind of you know turn briefs on their head to see how. Uh, how you could actually say speculate about a more interesting way of things to play out. So yeah, that's me. Great, thanks, first right. Um, Akshat, we've got a couple of questions you want to ask because we've got a bunch of questions coming in. So I want to, I'm going to jump to that. But there's something you want to add, Akshat? Uh, no, I think uh, uh, IAS's presentation was fairly structured and fairly comprehensive. I I think that um, one of the things that when we, we talk about not just clean, we also should talk when we talk about clean energy, we also, also talks about impact on ecosystems, right? And biological impact. Yeah. So from the slide you showed of a uh, solar farm, right? Imagine how much, because the black reflective surfaces, how much heat you're reflecting back into the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. And Absolutely. there are studies that are done on what happens to birds and these are not regular birds, you know, because when you, when you, when you do these large solar farms, you actually go out into uh, remote spaces on the, in, you know, you may be in the desert or in the middle of a jungle or some such, it's absolutely uninhabited land where there are species that are, that, that occupy it are usually more uh, endangered or yeah. rare. And these sort of, these are flying over for a few kilometers over these, they actually do get 
heat it up. So there are situations where you'll have like large swarms of birds just dropping down, you know, getting heat strokes and just getting cooked in the air and they don't know what's happening to them. Um, uh, also, you know, one of the recent studies I was, one of the, one of the readings I was doing led me to the energy cost in Germany, right? Germany is leading the world in, uh, solar, in, yeah. uh, in, in solar and the yeah. cost of energy has more than doubled there. Yeah. Uh, which is, yeah. which is quite something, right? Um, but I think uh, like what I found are a few similarities. I think we, one project I didn't show here was a, was a project we, we had proposed for uh, Mumbai for the make in India center, right? So we had a giant lion sort of in plan. So when you fly over it, it was the old sixties modern idea of what happened when you, how do you see a city when you fly over it? So we had a giant lion in as a morphological form that was held up by cranes and whatnot to form that. It was also done by an illustrator for us because we turned the project around in three days. But um, I think we can take questions. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of them coming in. So guys, I'm going to open up the Q&A uh, for the questions that have come in from the audience. I'm going to read out um, and I think they're mostly, some of them are for you both, some of them are directed to each of you, so I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, the uh, the question about the uh, names for your uh, studios was actually asked by Maya. So sorry, Maya, I didn't mention it before, but if you're listening in. Um, the next, uh, I have a couple of questions here. So one is, uh, one that's come in is from uh, Nidip, um, oh. who asks, uh, aside from the competitions which are infamously exploitative, how can design practices do more speculative work considering that there are rarely clients willing to pay for it. And this is for you both. I think you just do it. I think you, I think you, I mean, research is never, uh, we're not, we're not, we're, a design practice is usually not, not an academic institution. And you do research for various reasons. You do it for, you, you do it to feed your own self, like your own mind, uh, your own head. And then sometimes you do it to, you know, to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to pass it on to someone else for information. I mean, a lot, I think most of the research that we're talking about here, or the speculative ideas that were discussed here, were just done for our own selves. They were never meant to generate uh, money or such. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's kind of what we meant when we talked, when I spoke about resource-based uh, economies or resource-based systems, which is, you, not everything has to have a productive or a, uh, a financial outcome. It could just be done for the sake of doing it. And I think we do that when we're younger, right? When we're, when we're kids, we still do that. We, we do things just for the sake of doing them. Um, and, I, and I also, at the same time, think when you build up your research body of work, or your speculative work, you would have found a direction and eventually somebody who needs that will find you. Uh, it's again, it's, it's, it's speculative. It's like you're being, that's your purest cerebral slash artistic form, right? That's where it goes down to. That's at least uh, our approach to it as a studio. Yeah, for sure that uh, it, it's uh, super resonant. And I feel, uh, you know, uh, more often than not, uh, speculative fiction actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'd be very suspicious of uh, commissioned speculative fiction, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, which is, uh, it sort of already gets tainted by, uh, you know, kind of market driven, uh, you know, situations where speculative fiction is one of those, I feel one of those purest uh, kind of re regimes where if one looks at benchmarks within, say, Archigram or, uh, you know, within the work of Buckminster Fuller in the 60s, if one draws those kind of parallels, uh, they tend to be world changing. But I feel uh, if, uh, you know, like, I don't think the geodesic dome would have been commissioned by someone, uh, you know, if it wasn't a purist inquiry. So I feel uh, speculative fiction, if we put that kind of pressure on the quality of the idea or the quality of the uh, deliverable, um, I think uh, that's, that's good pressure. It's, it's the very few design projects can take that kind of pressure, right? Uh, in terms of pure ideation, undiluted by uh, any kind of budget or any kind of, uh, you know, site requirements. Uh, I think every project has uh, internested within it the chance to be a, a speculative fiction project, right? Because 
the speculative fiction will not come to an unprepared mind. I mean, you need to be doing this mapping uh, of, you know, uh, data extrapolation. You need to be like, so we've been building a map of the year 2035 for the last four and a half years. And uh, it's become fairly elaborate now. Uh, but now that one has done a base mapping, you can actually start seeing parallels now. So say, what is the future of gender? And how does that future of gender work in, say, the accessory design uh, kind of domain? So uh, I don't think the speculative fiction will come suddenly out of a commissioned project. I think you need to have done a X amount of mapping, like what Akshat is saying. Like you need to have done, uh, or you need to be at least churning this out regularly enough for, uh, you know, for you to have a loose understanding of what's going on. And then the connections become uh, interesting to explore in that kind of situation. Yeah, I think for students, it's important to understand that there is a there is an imaginative speculative part of it, and then there's a process part of it. So you need to do the mapping, the research, the the methodology to achieve that in some yeah. sense in any project that you want to do. Um, a follow up to this question. I, think, yeah, I just to... want to add something to what uh, what I have said. Right, I, I remember saying a few few hours back that we had Peter Cook over, and one of the things Peter Cook told me over dinner was that productivity and consistency is overrated. And he meant that in the context of architectural projects, right? You don't need to be a firm churning out one successful project after the other. Because if you're just doing that, then you're really flattening yourself out. Somewhere or the other, you're gonna to have to start leaping for at to the next level. There are some firms who have achieved that. And I think most of those that have achieved that are firms that are doing research work, and doing real world work, right? So they're doing research, testing research, doing research, and they're doing it as appropriate, right? So, and I think the firm that's actually really leading that right now in the world is Foster and Partners. And the other one, I mean, in, in the architecture world, and the other one that did that for a very long time and therefore it is as successful as it is today is Zaha Hadid. Um, but I think the discourse at Zaha Hadid, at least the visible discourse in now, does not exist. It became a formal discourse, but as Foster still exists, even as a as a technocratic discourse. Yeah. Even uh, now, comes to mind, you know, like the the sort of um, the office of metropolitan architecture, the Rem Kula's office. Yeah. And the yeah. AMO, which is the sort of smaller, more abstract, random. Like, I mean, one is the sort of long long inquiries in urban planning, and the other one is very effervescent, you know. But there, you can see the the sort of commonality in terms of all their projects, which is really fun. A follow up to this question would be from Tanay Agarwal. Has your work in speculative fiction led to any tangible slash real world projects? If not, anything would you like to see translated in the near future? Uh, this is for both of you. Are there any in the process of, or there's yeah, something I could, that uh, the potential? I could, start, I could start that. I mean, so uh, we actually put out this uh, solar panel, uh, you know, sort of uh, speculation in a few different formats. So. Uh, we also did like a little long format writing on hard copy uh, and uh, which was interesting uh, is that one of our old clients is actually a restaurant client. Uh, he reached out to us because he, uh, who I didn't know, was also a developer. And, uh, you know, so they were doing a few high rises in Bombay and uh, he reached out to say that, you know, I really like this idea of the solar temple and can you do something on our rooftop? So I think... Uh, uh, there, there is uh, there is a grammar there where, uh, you know, someone can spot the big idea uh, and then see how they would probably want to do, maybe not execute it verbatim, but the idea is to kind of, you know, see, okay, this is the thought process and how can I execute a small uh, test or a, sm a small pilot project. Uh, and do, in doing that pilot, you kind of obviously learn a lot of things which will then also inform your larger idea. So, uh, so there is definite uh, resonance and I feel... Uh, I mean, the, the, but the point is to not wait for the resonance. I mean, the point is to output these ideas anyway. I mean, we're living in the age of copyleft, right? I mean, anyone teaching you IPR or uh, patent protection, all that is, uh, you know, is complete bullshit. So I think uh, that that's a regime that we need to get out of completely. I think at the end of our lives, if we're going to uh, count the amount of ideas we saved, uh, it's going to be a, you know, a really, really sad kind of situation. So Yeah, we're not, like, we're not going to take them with us. So. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that's what I... Sorry. No, go for it. Go for it. I, I think that's exactly what um, I tell people as well. Um, there is no need to hold on to your idea. Just let it go. You know, even to artists, like give away your art. Why do you, I mean, why did you make it? It's made. It's, it's paint on canvas. So as, if you've got it out there, it'll germinate something. If the idea is to germinate something, True. then the, then it's important to get it out there. 
also and well to to take your other point about a client identifying his need and then coming to you let's not forget that we are not the only smart people out there there's some very i mean we may think we're smart but there's some very very smart people who are industry leaders and and thought leaders out there economists industrialists so on and so forth they will find you that it's happened with us they they do they are always on the lookout for people who would have synergy so unless and until you're getting your information out there no one's going to find it so you really do need to get it out um uh you know make an india happen for us in the same way when we did the pavilion uh it happened as a it was it was not just per chance and um i think i, I remember having dialogues with people saying you know we've reduced ourselves to traders you know and we need to start we need to make it easy to make things here again people need to start investing in in industry and making because if people don't invest in industry then industry doesn't invest in designers because they don't need them right uh, they don't uh, often when industries invest in design cells they also have like very serious very thorough uh, uh, r&d divisions right and where they are where they generate future thought for themselves because it's very important for industry with such heavy investment to sustain right for and what is the investment that really goes into a design studio it's just your own time in your mind space and a, a little bit of equipment but industry is taken like cold hard hundreds of crores of cash so they need to sustain um, so get your ideas out there uh akshar i think this it seems appropriate this question from apu prakash um uh when you talk about um uh people out there would be willing to uh, invest in these kind of ideas uh approve us would the policy makers would be open to such ideas and learning from the past and how would a resource based economy work in today's context well in my interaction policy makers they are fairly open minded and they are very receptive as long as you know how to present yourself and there is no one slotted way of presenting yourself they are um, i'm actually amazed at the quality of discussion i've had in government departments um so never judge a book by its cover uh, so yes they are open to it and uh, it's about again creating provenance and then reaching out because remember everyone's reaching out to them all the time so they have to have reason to listen to you and that reason is not only about uh what celebrating certain things right i went in my conversations with uh will the with the prime minister he sort of rattled off names from of guys studying something doing phd's and i and i've been sort of taken aback saying how do you remember what you saw 5 years ago and how do you remember the guy's name you know just like phd students master he would remember even that right there is a master student doing research on that why don't we try and reach out to him so that's how clued in they are i mean remember, let's not forget that these guys are i'm not saying all of them are equally good but i'm saying a lot of these people are in the are at the highest level of industry and planning and so on and so forth i mean look at what tata motors has churned out in the last year where do you think that came from it has to come from the top right because look at what they were doing 5 years ago so how did it suddenly turn around and that's also a conversation that's been had like i've been fortunate enough to have been in the meeting room for that 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 brief you know this has to happen and so then you start a company called tamo which is a speculative or which is an which is like a a, a concept hyper car company and you look at tata and say how what are you saying how can you even you make the indica how can you think of making a super car but they you know look at what the outcome is right um yeah and um, the second part of the question was uh that how do we move from a resource how would a resource based economy work in today's context uh i think a i think there is a huge contextual departure that is required right in terms of economy there is a departure that's required in terms of all our mindsets if you really look and and i think and i think the last 40 50 days have been a demonstration of it we've all been locked in how much have we really missed and how much have we really consumed how much have we really spent i'm i'm it's a short cycle stop yes but it's not a long cycle stop so we really i think there is change required at the individual level and there is change required at the systemic level 
uh, and I feel that both of these changes can be brought about easily enough. And if enough individual, if enough individual, individual set it out, then they will trigger the change. It just needs to be enough. It can't be commodified anymore. It has to be slightly selfless. Um, one like tiny example of it is Auroville. Look at it. Uh, and it was back then. I think Auroville has existed since late 60s or early 70s. Mm-hmm. So look at Auroville and see the aspirations of that community. It is stagnated, yes, but that is with anything. It will reach a point, stagnate, and then it needs to be kicked up a couple of notches, right? So it'll 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 get there. I I think I'm glad you brought up the uh, the the two levels of the individual and then at the policy level because Karan Maloka had asked what do people need to do at a personal level of habits or thinking they can so that they can uh, move to a, from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Um, I think you've answered that in some sense. You've also asked and you know you've also mentioned look at the Orville project and look at that as an example of how people have gotten together and if you individually at a collective level and at a sort of a much more macro level decided to uh, change things and change your mindset. I'll, uh, I'll just uh, right. hop in here for a minute. Like, uh, I think uh, the Aurobindo example is fantastic because uh, if you read Aurobindo, uh, I mean, his, uh, his perspective on the city is uh, so beautiful because what he says is this is a group of people of, uh, you know, from around the world who are committed only to individual excellence, right? That's really the framing. That's if you're committed to individual excellence, you will find your home in Auroville. And uh, that's the only kind of uh, guiding principle about why people find their way there. And, uh, essentially, the city becomes a way for you to work on your own yoga. So, I mean, he looks at the fact that, say, if you're a paper maker, uh, you be the most exceptional paper maker in the world. I mean, you kind of keep experimenting, keep working on your craft, keep doing this. And you find resonance of this in our uh, traditional crafts communities as well. I mean, if you look at the way uh, that, uh, that sort of system works. I think uh, we sense dystopias much earlier in cities, right? Uh, I mean, uh, for example, uh, I mean, we, I, I live in Goa now, like uh, since the last four years. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, the, you know, the lack of availability of raw material, for example, I mean, we got rice from our neighbor who has his own paddy field. Uh, we get papayas from, uh, you know, uh, a person uh, who has just, you know, planted three papaya trees three days ago, uh, sorry, three months ago. And, you know, we kind of share that resource. So uh, I, I completely get what Akshat is saying. I think we need to arrive at a certain, uh, uh, our own grammar of it. Like, what does that grammar mean in an in a urban situation? Does it mean that all of us have a small hydroponic, uh, you know, facility in our, on our terraces? Or do we need to actually start encouraging healthy barters between people? Like, so, I mean, there's an interesting analysis of a salad. If you want to make a really good salad on your own, you cannot grow everything in that bowl on your own. Like, there's no way. So you need to then have a barter with someone who's got really good cherry tomatoes who will offset your iceberg. And then, uh, you know, someone else who's growing rosemary or someone else who's growing dill. And then you actually then have uh, four people, five people can make a really good salad together and share that salad. So, I mean, if that can work at a salad level, I'm sure it can work at a urban planning level as well. I think it's a cool idea trying to imagine a carbon neutral salad or make a carbon neutral salad. Um, just kind of offsetting even energy consumption is really all the separate ingredients and how do you do that? And that's a pretty cool sort of way of looking at it. Guys, we're running out of time. I think we can take just two questions more. So I'm going to, uh, there are quite a few more, but um, one is, uh, I think this uh, would be, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, for Akshat, uh, uh, Vishal asks, is the, will the, the term sustainable still exist in the future? Or there might be a new or a better term available. I don't think, I think sustainability is a mindset. It is not a term. It's unfortunately been used as a buzzword. Now you can, you can change that in the English language dictionary and substitute it. But I, I believe the idea, I think the core idea of being able to do something to meet your needs yet leave behind enough for future generations is what sustainability is about. And uh, we all do it for, I mean, in India, we do it for, it's not a Western mindset at one level, but in India, we do it for our families, right? We earn money, we create habitat, we create space, we, we create resource the best we can for our, to meet our current needs. And we always leave behind some for 
uh, for the next generation, right? Oh, I've left this behind for my kids. That's a bill, right? You're doing that in your personal life, in the economic space every day anyway. So why should we not think about the physical realm as our own uh, as our own property and something that we're going to leave as legacy for the next generation? Uh, you have to. There is no way. So again, the the term and changing that term to something else in the English language dictionary, notwithstanding the the idea, will I think has to live on, and that's just nature. Um, Adarsh has a question. Uh, I'm going to breeze through this one because I think you guys can maybe very quickly. Any good resources to learn speculative design? This is for both of you. Um, any quick, quick examples or links that you can share with him and he can look it up. Or just your work, actually. Adarsh should just look into what um, Ayaz is talking about. A lot of his publications on issue, which I urge you to look at, uh, talk about this a lot. And it's a, it's a good way of sort of trying to get started on it. Akshat, you want to add some resources that you can think of or some projects that they should look up that you guys have done uh, in this That's area? A, I, I think uh, I think a great book called Speculative Everything, uh, which is uh, by Dun and Raibi. Um, that's a good place to start. Uh, uh, they also reference uh, many other, uh, you know, projects and writings. So uh, um, that's a good place to start. Akshar, anything you want to share? No, uh, I think start where I was just saying, but also look at, uh, like I said, for me, I looked at I stayed for uh, George Orwell, uh, Animal Farm, George Orwell. I yeah. looked at, um, I was listening to a lot of music at that time. I was listening to a lot of Queensryche, Operation Mind Crime, um, uh, Dream Theater, Scenes from a Memory. Uh, I was listening to uh, Pendulum, the band, right there, they have, uh, that's the first electronic band, the electronic metal band that actually came out, uh, well, really deep electronica, or, um, so it's actually all senses that sort of feed that, right, and then in terms of the world of design, I was looking at, uh, I think, look at Ross Lovegrove's work, uh, it's, it, it the, the older works, Philippe Stark's old, in, original works, and yes, Philippe Stark's current project work, I think he's Really, really at the top of his game again. Um, there are a few TED talks that you can you can see, and uh, well, of course, Archie Graham, uh, Ron Heron specifically, Cedric Price specifically, uh, um, and um, and yeah, Buckminster Fuller, of course. Yeah. I mean, and you'll all of this stuff is easily available on the internet. There is a yeah, film that I would say you should watch. It is called The Zeitgeist. It has three or four parts. You should, uh, three or four different parts. You should watch it. Another one called What the Bleep. And both of these films are available on YouTube for you to see. Cool. Um, I think that's quite a bit for you to check out. Uh, last question, guys, is from Raja Lakshmi, uh, who's asking, as a student who is on the verge of graduating, what is the opinion, your opinion on the job scenario we will be entering in the near future? But do it gently. I, th I think I think we're going to have a lot of students available to us. <laughs> uh, I look. At, listen, I think this, this for the last fifteen years I've been asked this question at least a few times every year. And it's always going to remain the same. So you can't, no matter what your situation, no matter where you come from, no matter how abysmal you think it is, um, this you that's where you start. And there is going to be no knight in shining armor or some golden baton that you will get to say this is what happens. No. And, uh, and, and if you are limited in resource or limited in, in various things, well, that's the greatest baton that you could be handed. Right? Necessity is the mother of invention. So find something to do. If you're a student and you don't get a job, then study a little more. I I still tell people that I'm, I mean, and, and I know people who are much older than me, including Peter Cope, who's more than 80 years old, who still says I'm a student of architecture, right? So um, you study and you just continue doing so. Uh, invest in your direction because that is your individuality. 
and then find someone to mentor it. And I think if you find a good studio that can that that accepts you as a skilled or a uh, then you should stay there. Come what may, you know. And it's not about it's not about finances or money or any such thing. It's for a, for a student. The first step is about professional learning and professional growth, intellectual and skill both. And when you find a place, do it. Come what may, pay them a little more money if you have to. That's what people used to do with Frank Lloyd Wright. He would he would charge in the day fifteen hundred dollars for a fellowship at his at at Talisman. And you would have to live in the desert, make your own home. Thank you, Ansar. I ask you got something to add? Um, yeah, I think uh, you know because I mean when you look at, when you look outside the studio of the world, it it seems fairly bleak. Uh, but I feel uh, you know it's uh, it's so much easier to get your thought process out there in the current uh, kind of you know connected social media age that we live in, right? So uh, you see amazing projects, you see amazing uh, visions of uh, you know uh, students uh, on you know college platforms on uh, their own personal kind of uh, social media platforms. So I think it's a great time to be highly productive. You know, I mean, the more productive you are, the more uh, you're working at an idea iteratively. Uh, every single stage of that idea is worth uh, putting out, and uh, you know, it's uh, so easy to reach out to people right now. I mean, a lot of our speculative fiction work is purely running on social media. I mean, you know, it's not like these projects are being published in the front page of some national newspaper. I mean, but these are things that uh, you can run a. Uh, a very very strong feedback and focus group almost on your own social media handles so i think the more you're connected with people who you feel share the same vision or have some sort of an insight into the future that you yourself want to explore it's so easy to reach out to those people right now start collaborative work uh, you know offer your offer your services offer yourself as a potential collaborator for uh, you know studios who you feel are pursuing a similar kind of an uh, interest and i feel it's only getting more nuanced you know like uh, for for example for us as a studio we are discovering that we are passionate about craft now after you know 15 16 years in practice so uh, and i feel many studios are evolving it's always a good time to kind of look at our own process and see what we've been passionate about but uh, you guys have a you know huge advantage like you're already getting into this world now uh so i think uh, there's many many things to be thankful for uh i mean uh, if one can look beyond the corona virus uh, so it's a good time yeah. to kind of be super productive yeah i think the fact that everything slowed down uh, also means that it gives students the opportunity to become more productive look for yeah, like minded uh, you know i think uh, one of the things that you know the pandemic has kind of put upon us i feel is uh, many practices that were shallow and wide uh, have now forced to go narrow and deep you know yeah. so i think it's a it's a very interesting time like people are self selecting what they want to do because you have limited time i mean you have uh, you know you want to do x amount of work and you're now more yeah. focused on quality more focused on getting really really you know get your hands dirty with every single nuance of that work because a lot yeah. of the fluff is gone you know a lot of the uh, all the frills are gone so it's interesting Cool. I think we're almost out of time, uh, so I want to wrap up this session. I there are a lot more questions, but I'm sorry we couldn't go through all of them. I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in and sent their questions. Uh, if you want, you can, all, like we mentioned before, please email us at designloungeindia@gmail.com, and we will try and get some more questions answered. Um, but thank you for giving us your time. And Ayaz and Aksha, thank you so much uh, for your time. This was an excellent chat. And given the uh, number of participants, I think a lot of people have stayed till the end, have been waiting to ask their questions. And that's such a great sign. And that's kind of what Design Lounge is about. So all there, uh, like I mentioned before, all of Aksha's social media, Aksha and Ayaz's social media information, etc., is in the in the chat box. So please do uh, reference that whenever you have time. The next episode of Design Lounge is coming up on the twentieth of May, so please tune in for that, and we will have um, more updates on that soon. Uh, Shushti, anything else that you would like to add? Please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you both, and uh, actually thank all three of you. That was an excellent session, and just by the barrage of questions, we know that we could have gone at least another half an hour, forty-five minutes, and maybe this means that uh, we need to get you to the classroom, both of you. 
um, uh, we'd be very happy to have that um, actually. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking when I was looking at uh, the questions and some of the things that um, people have been asking, uh, maybe we also start creating like a resource bank because um, we get a lot of speakers and I think it can be publicly available. So like the list of movies, somebody's asked a list of books, um, maybe some of the studios in speculative design that people can follow, um, designers, creatives, even for you guys, some of the stuff that you've um, shown us here can be accessible. Um, so I have a small proposal before we close and maybe we might take a little bit more of your time, um, Ayaz and Akshat. Um, some of the questions that we haven't been able to take up, uh, we'll send them out to you. So if you could answer them, we will post the answers on the Facebook page for Pearl Academy. Um, we will also maybe put together a PDF document, which could be a, a resource list. Uh, I already have one uh, made because I do uh, teach uh, speculative design. Um, so maybe um, that's a great starting point and I'll share that with you guys and you can add to it, build on it. Um, that would be amazing. And I think uh, Design Launch could have a resource book which can be accessible, open source. Yeah. To uh, I would really like to promote that. Um, so if that's okay with you, um, we, we might have some follow-up work. We're, we're going to bug you a little bit more, but I think it's important because Shishi and I were discussing it earlier because we wanted you guys to share stuff that you guys know to um, look up and reference and um, you know take insights from stuff that you guys have discussed and new stuff that they'll probably discover on their own. So I think that's a good idea. Cool. Sounds good. Great. Um, guys, thank you so much again. I think we're going to end this session now. And I hope, uh, thank you for everyone tuned in. Um, we're going to look forward to seeing you guys next time on the next episode of Design Lounge. All right. Thank thanks, so guys. Much.